You know, at my age, I got stories. I got decades, and I can just uh, try to get into it. Um, today is my belly button birthday. I have brought a carload of hecklers with me. And uh, for the people that don't know, I work at Bridgeway, and I'm an addiction treatment specialist there. And one of the gifts that I've gotten out of, out of getting clean is I get to uh, work in the men's residential program. And we get as many as eight guys at a time, and I get to work with those eight guys for two months. And uh, the bottom of the end of the, at the end of the day, I get to twist them up into a fucking ball and twist their minds up into a ball, and then we kick them out. <laughs> and uh, and then and uh, see how they do. And uh, is what I love about that is that all I do is bring them to meetings and let them meet people and show them what our recovery looks like. And uh, it's been a big fight to be able to do that at Bridgeway, but I've uh, I've, I've I've you know I've, I've pounded my head against the wall and I've I've stood my ground long enough that they pretty much let me do it. And I can say this: it's working. It's working for a lot of people, you know. And so God gave me that. So that's my life. That's what my life looks like today. Um, I'm going to skip my childhood because I, I just, you know, my childhood was fucked up, and uh, and uh, it was full of loss and it was full of trauma. And uh, but I remember, you know, I started going to JDH at a really young age. I was a chronic runaway. Um, I had no mother. And, uh, and I didn't know my father very well, so I didn't have no place to call home. And so institutions became my home. And, you know, I thought I was a pretty smart kid, and I can, I can remember saying sometime at around 13 or 14 when I was starting to do drugs that I was never going to be a junkie, that I would never be a heroin addict. And I stood on that, you know, pretty proudly, you know, like I was better than that. I was never going to let that be part of my life because I was starting to see it around in my world. And um, the first time I really got to experience seeing it, um, I was going to Whitaker, and uh, I met a guy. And as soon as we looked at each other, we became best friends. And his dad was a heroin addict. And back then, there wasn't a whole lot of heroin addiction in the Salem area. There was a small handful, maybe, I don't know, 50 people that were heroin addicts, and they were close-knit. And, uh, and it turns out that he was like the leader of the pack, you know what I mean? He was an older guy. And so somewhere at about 13 years old, I uh, went over to visit my friend Frank. We used to smoke weed all the time. And I was still on this, I'll never be a junkie. And I watched him swing their arms and wind up for a long time and grab their arms and shoot up. And it wasn't very appealing, you know what I mean, to a 13 or 14 year old that was going to school and smoking weed. And I thought, who the fuck would want to do that? You know what I mean? It's, it looked like a whole lot of drama. And uh, what followed that was coming over there on the evenings and seeing large stacks of money. You know, because he didn't try to hide what he did from us. We were cool kids, you know what I mean? We kept our mouths shut. So he didn't try to hide what he did from us. And uh, that part of the heroin addiction became appealing, seeing the money. And uh, so as, you know, as, as I went on through my teenage years, still saying I was never going to be a heroin addict, there was these things called Percodans. And a lot of people would eat these Percodans. I didn't really know what they were. But I, as soon as I got it, um, I was standing in a room and somebody had some, and I said, I want some of those, and I took them. All the trauma that I experienced as a child went away. You know, I felt cool. I felt all, all right. It just warmed me up, and I felt good. I had confidence. I had energy. And I felt okay for the first time probably in my life. Alcohol made me feel a little okay, but this shit made me feel good. And... Still not wanting to be a heroin addict, there I was. And um, by the time I was 18, I was, uh, I was doing my first bit in the county jail for weed. They threw you in jail for weed back then. And I was doing a year in the county jail, a year in the old county jail down here in Marion County for a pound of weed. 
And when they locked me up in there, um, I went through my first withdrawal. And I didn't even know I was going through withdrawal. I just knew that I was tossing and turning and my nerves were crawling out of my body and my nose was running and I felt sick. And it was another old guy that said, what have you been taking? And I said, well, I was at the work center and I was doing a lot of Dilata and Percodans. And he said, you're sick, you're dope sick. And that was my first experience with being sick. I was 18 years old. And um, I got out of that, that jail sentence. And uh, immediately following that jail sentence, I started selling heroin. And uh, there was one rule in the circle that I was in to selling this heroin, and that was that you don't use it. I could not, I could not do that. So I was, these guys gave me a pass and they allowed me to use it. And that ended me up in a, uh, by the time I was 23, I was, hi Alex. Hi. <laughs> By the time I was 23, I was sitting back in that same jail, and uh, I was going on my way to federal prison for, uh, for selling heroin. And um, I was 23 years old, they gave me seven years in the federal prison, and uh, they shipped me off to Texarkana, Texas. And throughout that prison sentence, I told myself I was never going to use heroin again. Although while I was in prison, whenever someone would come in, I would use it. But by the time I got ready to get out, I had made some, some firm commitments in my life that I was never going to use heroin again. So there I was, I was getting out, I was 27 years old, I was on top of the world and I was never going to use heroin again. And life was pretty dang good right then. And uh, I got out and life was good. That's all I'm going to say about that, and and it was good for about seven or eight months. And I was driving down Commercial Street, and I'd seen one of my old friends that I did heroin with, and I immediately did a UE and chased his ass down. And I don't even know why I did this, and I told him, where can I get some shit? And, uh, and there I was again. And within a small amount of time, I could say six, seven months, I was strung out on heroin again. And... Um, and I lost a lot of stuff. I lost a lot on that addiction. And uh, it cost me a lot of friends, it cost me a lot of family. And uh, it nearly got me killed. Um, and, uh, and I couldn't stop using it. I remember I went to White Oaks one time to stop. I stayed there for two days and I was like, this is not for me. I was not ready to quit and I still couldn't admit that I was a heroin addict. I still thought somehow something was gonna happen to make me quit. And uh, I went through a lot, of, a lot of loss in that one, a lot of personal loss, a lot of uh, lying. You know, I lied to everybody for a long time. And, uh, and all the people around me wanted me to do was quit using heroin. And it was family, and I couldn't do it. And um, I ended up on that one. I ended up at, uh, I was 33 years old. I was going back to federal prison for another arrest that was uh, for growing marijuana. And they sent you to federal prison for that too, by the way. <laughs> and, um, and I remember when I went into jail, um, it was a self-commit. Um, I took a bunch of drugs with me. And I got caught for the bunch of drugs that were with me after I was in jail. And that's what happens when you pass out and you leave the shit under your pillow. And um, I got a bunch more charges. So I didn't get out of jail when I was supposed to get out. And I ended up going back to federal prison. And uh, I was there until I was 35 years old. This time, by God, I was not going to use heroin. You know what I mean? I really had uh, spent a lot of time. They didn't have um, 
recovery back then and they didn't have treatment, but they started in the federal prison system, they started a DAP program, it was called Drug and Alcohol Prevention. And they actually gave you a time cut if you completed that program, but it was brand new. And I wasn't gonna get no time cut because I was back on a, uh, on a limited sentence and I was gonna be getting out before I could possibly get a time cut. But I went in and did the program as much as I could do and I felt pretty good about myself and I made a commitment not to use heroin again. But I didn't make a commitment not to use anything else. And I remember that I got on a plane in Fort Worth, Texas, and when I got off that plane, I was drunker than shit when I was released. And, uh, and I continued to drink for about six months and, like we do, started using heroin again. So there I was at 36, using heroin again, and, uh, and I had a baby. I had a baby boy on the way. And, uh, this was kind of a fucked up period of my life because I was so addicted to the heroin, I was using so much of it, and so was the baby mama who I married, that that baby was born. Um, 11 days before he was born, I got arrested again for heroin this time. And uh, she got arrested too, and she bailed out, and that baby was born a heroin addict. And I might start crying. The first four months of that kid's life was kicking heroin. Mm -hmm. And in my, you know, that's where my life had taken me, that that was okay. You know, that was the best I could do for that kid. You know, it was just to pray that he would come out okay and just to pray that he could make it through that. And, uh, I was able to get out of jail and spend the first four months with him and then I went back into jail and I was in there for 10 months. And I got out and, uh, and I picked him up and he was, he was 16 months old and, uh, and I raised him for the next five years, six years. And during that period of six years, I decided that I was just gonna be on methadone. And uh, I remember saying I was going to be on methadone the rest of my life because I just needed something. I was not normal. And so I was on a methadone program, and what that kid gets to remember is going down to the methadone clinic in Portland every day. And, uh, you know, it was kind of fucked up period of my life. And I discovered methamphetamine in that period of my life. And I remember the first time I smoked that shit, that was the answer to all my... I wasn't tired no more. <laughs> I can sure make it to work, but I can tell you in the next five years, my life began to get crazy like it does when you do that stuff. And, um, and I got arrested again for growing marijuana again. And they put me back in prison for growing marijuana again. And at this point, I lost my kid and uh, my in-laws took care of him. And I got out of that prison sentence. I'd went through a drug treatment program at, uh, at EOCI, and it was called the STEPS program. And I was angry when I went in the program, and I was angry when I got out of the program. And at this part of my life, I just didn't give a fuck anymore. I was just angry, and I think I'd kind of accepted the fact that I was just gonna be a criminal. And a crazy ass motherfucker the rest of my life. And I started riding with the Jokers all the time and, uh, and just being nuts. And I had my kid with me. And that lasted about two and a half years. And uh, my kid actually asked me to go back to the foster home that he was in. He was actually in a foster home when I got out of prison after that marijuana growing thing, and he asked me to go back to that foster home. And I called those people up and asked them to come pick him up because I was not a good parent and I could not handle the responsibility of raising him. And he went back. And then I started to, he went back on a contract that I made, a verbal contract I made with these people for visitation and stuff and then all of a sudden they started telling me we're not going to let you see your kid anymore and so I started fighting to get my kid back 
with little hope. And uh, the state ended up stepping in and saying that if you didn't sign an agreement to release your custody from this kid, we're just going to take him from you forever. So I did that. I signed the agreement. And baby mama was in jail for more drug addiction at the time. So my kid was gone. And then, uh, hell, uh, <clears throat> I just kept on being absolutely insane at this point and not even trying to curb my addiction or anything and in uh, about three more years after that I was arrested again for heroin and this time when I went to jail I was so sick when I went in this time that they took me straight to the infirmary. They didn't even put me in the block. They didn't put me in D block. They didn't put me in C block. They took me, they called ahead and asked for an infirmary bed. And they stuck me in there and I dehydrated so bad after five days, they just took me, put me in a wheelchair and took me to the hospital. And, and, I, and at that one there, I got, uh, that was my last sentence, you know, and I got 40 months. And during that 40 month sentence, I didn't have one visit. I didn't have anybody to call. I didn't have any people left in my life. I had one phone number then, my sister, and she would accept a call from me once in a while and talk to me. And my heroin addiction had just gotten so bad and my insanity had gotten so bad. And the people that I thought were my people didn't even have freaking phones. And so that's where my life had taken me. At the end of that 40 month sentence, as I was being released, you know, I did a lot, I did a little bit of treatment while I was in there. I started going to NA meetings while I was in there, and I met my sponsor, who I have as my sponsor today, and uh, I met him in there. And at the end of that sentence, I was walking out of prison, and I was 52 years old, and I was wondering what the fuck happened with my life. You know, I was 52 years old, you know, and I started this thing off, and, and I'd spent 15 years of my life in prison. I'd been in over 20 prisons, and I couldn't figure out what the fuck happened. And I was, I didn't even realize how angry I was, because I'd been put on a lot of uh, work crews that, during that 40 months, and I got to see all four mountain ranges in Oregon, and I got to work outside a lot, and I was in a bunch of different forest camps. But as I was being released, I was down in R&D and I had a friend waiting for me out in the parking lot. And the officer said something to me that I thought was disrespectful and I lost my shit. And I did not get released that morning. And I almost picked up new charges and um, I left that prison in handcuffs that day. I was pretty pissed off. And, um, and I got out of prison. And I had been praying for the last year that I would never use heroin again. And I got out on November 10th of 2010. And on Thanksgiving, I was loaded on heroin again, which was two weeks later. And so there, there I was again, strung out on heroin, 53 years old and didn't still know how, to, how I was ever going to get away from this shit. You know, and I, I started going around and seeing some of the people that hadn't been going to prison that I'd grown up with my whole life that were heroin addicts. And what I was seeing in that world wasn't a very pretty picture. And uh, I started being thankful. I started being thankful for the prisons that I'd been to and the life that I'd had that I'd led because I was still fairly healthy and most of these guys were tore up from the floor up and suffering from all kinds of diseases that you suffer from in this disease. And it was painful to watch. And it started me on this weird road that I was going to have to do something with my life. And uh, um, I ended up just, uh, just about as strung out as I'd ever been. My, my level of doses were higher and higher. And uh, I was on methadone. I was on Valium. I'd reached a stage where I could just go to doctors and ask them for what I wanted, tell them what I wanted. They'd just give it to me. And 
because of all my incarceration and stuff, I was able to figure out any diagnosis they wanted. I was on three Valium tens a day, I was on 100 milligrams of methadone a day, and I was shooting as much heroin as I wanted. And I don't know what happened to me. Somehow I got really depressed in that period and I made a phone call and I told somebody, I, want, I told my sister, I want you to come pick me up out of this house that I'm in next week and I'm gonna throw all my shit in storage and I'm gonna go turn myself into my parole officer and make him lock me up. That was a great plan. Except my parole officer told me, we ain't locking you up just to detox you you're going to have to come in you're going to have to get arrested for a new crime and call an ambulance to have me taken from the uh, PO's office to the hospital. And somehow in the period of that and the next couple of weeks, I ended up at Bridgeway's door. And I remember when I pulled into Bridgeway, I uh, still had some heroin left and I sat out in the parking lot and I shot it. And I looked at Bridgeway's door and I thought, what in the fuck is this little tiny place going to do for me when I'm used to all these big, huge institutions where you can't use drugs and they weren't helping me, you know what I mean? They weren't giving me what I needed. So I did my little shot of heroin. I didn't know it was going to be my last shot. And uh, I kind of <coughs> crazy with my higher power that it is my last shot. And I knocked on those doors and I walked in. And... Uh, and I started my road to recovery. Um, when I walked in, you know, in this town at that time, that was in, uh, that was May 17th, 2012, I knew two people that were in recovery. And that was Steve, and that was my sponsor that I met, Michael. And I'd only been in there for about a half an hour and I was going through my intake screening and freaking Steve walked through the door. And I remember sitting there, I remember seeing him out of the corner of my eye and I was wondering how the hell did he know I was here, number one, and being really embarrassed because I was not in very good shape. I was down to about 135 pounds. And, and I just kind of hid my face from him because I didn't want him to see me. And he walked up to me and he gave me a big hug and he told me, uh, you're in the right place. And he said, we've all been worried about you because I had went to one NA meeting out of Staten during this period that I'd been through of addiction. And... Um, that was the first time in a long time that I'd ever heard someone say that people were worried about me. And that started, that little, those few words right there started me wanting to get and stay clean, you know. Um, in the world that I came from, people didn't worry about you. People didn't say kind things to you, you know. Um, they either wanted what you had or you wanted what they had and that was your life you know that's what life was and so what started happening was i started meeting people that cared about how i felt they cared about what i needed and they cared about who i was you know what i mean other than being a heroin dealer and a heroin addict and, you know, you can see it's painful. It, it was painful for me to accept people being nice to me. Because I came from a world where it's just institutions and prisons and heroin addiction and shit like that. And, man, I'll tell you what, I got on a pink cloud there at Bridgeway, and for those of you that have watched my journey, I couldn't get off it. You know what I mean? I stayed on it for a long time. I'm still on it. And I remember sitting in my first NA meeting out there in Staten, and I was sweaty, and I was still coming down off all the shit. And I knew when Bridgeway told me they were gonna let me stay there for 60 days, I thought, well, I knew from experience that I still wasn't gonna be well in 60 days, I was still gonna be sick. But I knew I was gonna be better. And I remember sitting in my first meeting and looking around, and there was probably about as many people as there is here, and I was thinking, how in the hell did these people make this work for them? Because I couldn't see it. 
I couldn't see how sitting in a room uh, running through this NA literature and talking about um, addiction and stuff could help people. My mind was not there. And uh, there, there was a dude that, we have a break at that meeting, there was a guy at the break that came up to me and he said, I can see you struggling and uh, I want you to know that if you just bring your body, or you just bring your mind, your body, the mind will follow. And that little concept right there, I tried to understand. I said, okay, I'm just going to keep coming to these meetings because I knew for, that if I didn't make this recovery thing work for me, I was going to spend the rest of my life in prison and the rest of my life being a heroin addict. And, you know, in, in my little world, I didn't, I didn't, I never believed that the drug addiction would kill me. You know, I just, I've met too many people that survived that shit, and, uh, and it's a sad thing. I just didn't want to be that sad thing. Uh, I kept going to meetings. I learned as much as I could learn at Bridgeway about recovery. And uh, for the first time in my life, I had a genuine smile on my face and I started to be happy again. And, you know, when I was in Bridgeway, I still didn't know where my kid was. I had no idea where he was. I knew he was up in Alaska somewhere. And, um, and I couldn't find him. And I had this adoption agreement that said I had all these rights and all these rights they weren't given to me and I was angry about it. I used to call my, what, my well, I call her my mother-in-law. And, we, and I'd get mad and I'd get angry and I'd be like, well, what can we do to find these people and where can we find them? And she's like, I don't know. They can't do this and we need to get lawyers and blah, blah, blah. And none of us had money for lawyers. And I kept searching uh, social media for him and I was searching Facebook and searching Facebook. And I finally found him and his name was Tyler Griffiths. It wasn't even Tyler Weatherly anymore. And I sent him a friend request and he immediately accepted and he wasn't real happy with me. He wouldn't talk to me. I'd, I'd try to talk to him once in a while. I'd try to send him messages, and he wouldn't ever respond. You know, and I felt like that parent does that had been a bad parent. And so when his birthday came up and I had a little bit of money, I said, I'm, I'm going to send you some money. And I'm, I don't know, you won't talk to me, so I'm just going to send to this address that's on your profile. And I sent him some money. I sent him like 300 bucks. And then Christmas came around and uh, life was looking pretty good for me and I thought, you know what, I'm going to send you some Christmas money. And uh, so I sent him 500 bucks for Christmas. He never responded. Um, that March came around and I got a phone call from that guy that I'd made that verbal agreement with a long time ago. And the verbal agreement I made with him was take care of my kid until I can get clean and I can take care of him. And he called me up and he said, I've been watching you on Facebook and you look like you're doing pretty good. And he started asking me how I was doing. And at the end of that phone conversation, he said, I'm going to send your kid back to you because it's time for him to come home now. And I was pretty blown away by all that. And, uh, and he said, we're going to do a video call and uh, you know, I got on the video call with my kid, and it was, he was pretty much just like when he left me. He was like, hi, Dad. And he was like, okay, I'll see you next week. And uh, he got off the plane, and, you know, and this, can only, this can only happen in some weird context, is that God brought my kid back to me, and my kid is not a drug addict. And I don't know how that happened, you know? I don't have no explanation for that. I didn't know what to expect when he got off the plane. And, uh, but I know this, he's a little shit sometimes because I ask him, why did you do that? Why didn't you tell me that wasn't your address that I was sending that money to because I never got that money back? <laughs> and he told me, why didn't you 
be a good dad when you had an opportunity. You know what I mean? You were a drug addict. I didn't really feel like talking to you, is what he told me. And uh, he said, I didn't know you weren't an addict anymore. And so I spent, um, a few people know my son in here, and um, I spent the next couple of years dragging him around to meetings. And he got to know some of the guys in here, and he started having a good time, and he started understanding a little bit about addiction. And um, what I can say is that me and my son are best friends today, you know, and I'm still probably not the best parent, but he is, and they, you know, he he came down here and he got on the football team and he. He met a girl, and now I have a granddaughter, too. Pray for your kids to come home. You'll get kids. And, you know, at the end of the day is what I got to say is I got clean almost five years ago. And since that day that I walked into Bridgeway and I did that shot of heroin, my life has been really good. You know, I've had some ups and downs and some ins and outs, and life isn't always easy, and I bang my head a lot of times, and I get, I get angry. But I just keep going, and I get back up, and I put one foot in front of the other. And no matter fucking what, I don't get loaded. No matter fucking what, I don't go to the dentist and get a prescription. No matter fucking what, I don't go to the doctor and tell him it's okay to sedate me. I don't want to start that horrible disease that I had for 40 years. I don't want to ever give it a chance to get back into my body and get back into my mind. I'm pushing that thing as far away as I can get it. And I'm using the steps of Narcotics Anonymous, and I'm using my sponsor, and I'm using all you people out there to keep me clean. And I need every freaking one of you to help do that. I go to a lot of meetings, I stay in contact with people, and I let people know every day exactly how I feel. I let the guys that I mentor every day know exactly how the fuck I feel. And sometimes it isn't the best thing, you know what I mean? But I let people know what's going on in my life so we can talk about all the shit. And I appreciate the feelings that God has given me today. And for the people that are out there that are still struggling, just put 30 minutes at a time together. Put 15 minutes at a time together. Get to meetings. Talk to people about what's going on. You don't have to do this to yourself anymore. You don't have to go through 40 years of fucking horse shit. <clears throat> if you make it that long. The recovery community in this town is freaking strong. The recovery community in this country and in this world is strong. There's meetings going on every day in every country and every world. We are the biggest fucking tribe there is. We're the biggest gang there is. And uh, it's powerful. And that's what I started experiencing five years ago. I keep experiencing it every day. It's a wonderful thing, man. It is beautiful. My name is Jimmy. I'm an addict. That's all I got.